Well, good morning. So good to be here worshiping God with you all. I hope that you're ready for an interesting study. This is called Can Christians Drink Alcohol? Now, this topic may seem a bit random, but I've been asked this about, or I've been asked about this recently by several different people, and I was going to save it for Q&A. The problem is there's so much information here that it would have just taken up the entire Q&A session and we wouldn't have time for any other question. Uh, plus, House to House is starting next week, and I thought this would be a little bit tricky to try to set up a discussion about in House to House, so I thought, well, maybe I better get this sermon out of the way before that starts. Uh, <laughs> so I want to start by uh, introducing you all to what I call the wine paradox in the Bible. The word used for alcoholic beverages in the Bible is wine, or sometimes strong drink, and it shouldn't surprise us to find a ton of passages warning about the dangers of drinking alcohol. In fact, many verses <clears throat> make wine out to be a curse. So Proverbs 20 and verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler, and whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. Proverbs 23, 31 and 32, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Proverbs 31, 4 and 5, it is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink, for they will drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Hosea 4, verse 11, harlotry, wine, and new wine, take away the understanding. Ephesians 5, bring the New Testament on this. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, this is just a small sample. I mean, you could just continue to stack passages about the negative effects of wine and how terrible wine is. You should stay away from it. But it makes perfect sense, really, to find warnings like this because it's obvious how dangerous alcohol can be. But the paradox is found <clears throat> because you also have Bible verses that say that wine is a blessing. And again, you could stack many of these, but here's just a sample. I'll give you five. Genesis 14, 18. Whoops, excuse me, went a little too far. 14, 18. This is when Melchizedek meets Abraham. <clears throat> He's the king of Salem. He brings out bread and wine. And Melchizedek was a priest of God Most High. And there's another verse in Deuteronomy 14, which is about a tithe, offering to God a tithe of all of the produce of their land. And they were able to actually partake and, and eat and drink of some of the tithe that they offered to the Lord. And God said, look, if you can't actually bring your offering to Jerusalem, you can bring money with you, and then you can use that money to, to buy what you need for that offering. And so he says in Deuteronomy 14, 26, you may spend the money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink or whatever your heart desires. And there you shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. Psalm 104, about the provision of God. God causes the grass to grow for the cattle and wine, which makes man's heart glad, so that he may make his face glisten with oil and food, which sustains man's heart. In Isaiah 25, there's a picture of a future messianic and ultimately heavenly banquet. In Isaiah 25, 6, the Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow and refined aged wine. And then we've got John 2, <clears throat> where Jesus is at the wedding in Cana. He turns the water into wine. And the toastmaster, the, the host, says, Every man serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Now, this paradox of wine being described as a blessing in the Bible, but also a curse, has puzzled people and made people very uncomfortable for centuries. And I will admit, it's going to make us uncomfortable this morning. It makes me uncomfortable. And many have, unfortunately, twisted the Bible to get over that discomfort and have read their preconceived notions into the text. And I will totally confess that I sympathize because I have done that in the past as well. For instance, there was a huge movement in the 1800s that tried to argue and solve the paradox this way. They would said, well, look, all of the verses where wine is called a blessing, those verses were all about non-alcoholic, unfermented grape juice. But then anytime you see wine being referred to as a curse, well, that, that's alcoholic wine. 
Now, that would be a very convenient way to explain the paradox, and it would allow us to support a view of complete abstinence, which I actually really like, uh, but it's completely unfair to the text and the historical context in which the Bible was written. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but here's just one from the Bible. In Matthew 11, verses 18 and 19, Jesus said this, that John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. But the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. I know all too well the temptation to say, you know what, all of the passages where Jesus drank wine, like in people's homes or at the wedding in Cana or at the Lord's Supper, that must have just been totally non-alcoholic. That must have just been unfermented uh, grape juice made by, you know, Welch's. But if that's all Jesus drank... My question is, on what basis could they accuse him of being a drunkard? We know Jesus was not a drunkard. Drunkenness is a sin. Jesus was sinless. We know he was not a a drunkard. But the point is, he must have been drinking alcoholic wine in order to be accused of such a thing. Now, others have rightly pointed out that the word wine was used to describe grape juice at varying stages of the fermentation process. So another proposal has been, okay, all of the blessing verses, that's referring to, yeah, you know, it is alcoholic wine, but it's like really, really early in the fermentation process. So it's, you know, it's not very strong. But all of the curse verses, well, that's talking about really, really strong, fer- heavily fermented wine. Well... It is true that the word wine can refer to grape juice on you know, various parts of the spectrum, but God never says wine in the early stages of fermentation is a blessing, but wine in the later stages is a curse. He, the Bible just does not say that. In fact, in Deuteronomy 14.26, which we read earlier, he allows them to drink strong drink. And in Isaiah 25.8, he described us as being served at the heavenly banquet with aged wine in the later process of fermentation. So, you know, you're feeling some of the discomforts, right? And how do we, how do we solve this paradox? What do we do with this? Well, uh, here is, here's the key, is to know that ancient alcoholic beverages were different from ours today. In ancient times, the strongest alcoholic wine available to them was around 10 to 11% alcohol by volume, or ABV. There's some debate about what the word strong drink really referred to in in Hebrew back in Deuteronomy 14. Many believe this is what it's referring to, the sort of the strongest alcoholic content that they could have, which was 10 10 or 11 percent ABV. Uh, Others believe that it was referring to alcohol that was made from something other than grapes, like from, from grains, for instance. But this was the strongest that there was. And the Jews and Gentiles, even even pagans, were very concerned to avoid getting drunk because they all realized the dangers and all the bad stuff that happens when you get drunk. And so the ancients, they used methods to decrease the alcoholic content. They could not remove the alcohol content completely. But they could reduce it somewhat And they could slow down the process of fermentation some with processes like filtration and boiling and cold storage by submerging it in water. In fact, there's probably a reference to filtration in Isaiah 25, 6, which we read earlier, where it says that the aged wine was refined. The most common way, though, that they would cut the alcoholic content was by diluting it with water. Typically, three parts water to one part wine. And there were debates about, you know, what's the best ratio? What's the most proper thing? Um, Sometimes they, you know, would do more than three parts. Sometimes it was four parts. Sometimes it was eight parts. Um, But it kind of depended on, on where you were. Three to one was the most likely ratio during Jesus' day of dilution. But there's some hints about this in the Old Testament, like Proverbs 9, 1 1 and 2. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has prepared her food. She has mixed her wine. She also has set her table. So here is wisdom serving wine. Uh, And many believe, though, that that the mixed wine here was was mixed with water, okay, to dilute it or or to cut it. 
um, between the Old and the New Testaments, we have writings from Jews. Here's one from 2 Maccabees. This is not God's word, but it was uh, a writing by, by the Jews. And they said this, It is injurious to drink wine by itself or to drink water by itself, whereas wine mixed with water produces a pleasant and delicious drink that enhances one's enjoyment. <clears throat> so this isn't God's word, but it kind of reflects what the Jews commonly thought. And that was that it was harmful to drink wine by itself because of the dangers of drunkenness. And they were really trying to avoid that. But they also thought it was harmful to drink water by itself because they didn't have bread or water filters like we do. And there were some contaminants and it was sometimes kind of hard to find clean you know, potable water. <clears throat> and so they would mix the alcohol in with the water to serve as kind of a disinfectant, if you will. And the the Jews were not alone in this. The Romans and the Greeks, they all cut their wine with water too. And again, the most common ratio in Jesus' day was three to one. And what's fascinating is that even pagans back then believed that drinking wine unmixed with water was barbaric. We also have writings from early Christians who drank, and plenty of these writings, uh, from Christians who drank wine during the Lord's Supper, but they mixed that wine with water. Diluting wine with water was also a way to make, it was just kind of a practical thing to make your wine last longer. It was, you know, it was valuable. People, people loved it. We'll mix it with water. We can make it last longer. Also, sometimes, just depending on how the wine was handled, sometimes the wine could be overly sweet, and so people would use water to try to cut some of that edge off the sweetness. Sometimes, though, the wine, you let too much oxygen in. I don't fully understand how the process works, but it could turn very sour and be tremendously bitter. In fact, that's what they served Jesus while he was on the cross. They lifted up that sour wine uh, to Jesus. Now, I could not find exactly how much the other methods of filtration and cold storage could lower the alcoholic content. People in that kind of 1800s movement, there's still some proponents of it today, well, they try to argue there was just zero percent. Like they, they, they could just make pure grape juice, and that's what everybody was drinking. We just know that that's not true now. There's a huge, <laughs> massive 400-page study that was done that kind of debunked uh, all that stuff. It would still be alcoholic. But we do know with the dilution by water, it reduced the wine to around 2.75 to 3% alcohol by volume. Now, by contrast, today, we use methods not to decrease alcoholic content, but to increase alcoholic content. The distillation process was invented in the 8th century AD, whereby we can actually raise the alcoholic content of our drinks. So here is a chart of some of our modern drinks and their ABV percentages. And again, keep in mind the comparison that in Jesus' day, the alcohol by volume was around 3%. Vodka today has 40 to 95% ABV. Tequila has 50 to 51% ABV. Gin, rum, whiskey, 36 to 50%. Liquor, 15%. Fortified wine, 16 to 24%, unfortified wine, 14 to 16%, and then beer can range anywhere from 4 to 12%. Usually the average beer is 5%, uh, though some craft beers can reach up to, up to 12%. So just to give you an idea, if you drank one glass of vodka, assuming it was just 50% ABV, it would be the equivalent of nearly 17 glasses of what Jesus was drinking. Earlier, I mentioned that there were some Christians who try to oversimplify this issue and say, well, you know, all the wine that Jesus drank was non-alcoholic, therefore drinking any alcohol today must be forbidden. Well, there's also Christians who oversimplify this issue in the other direction. And they say, well, the wine Jesus drank was alcoholic, therefore it's totally fine for us to be drinking alcohol today. It's not that simple either. Because the alcoholic content from then to now is not an apples to apples comparison. Even modern day wine, which is unfortified, meaning not going through any of the distillation process, is still five times stronger than what Jesus was drinking in his day. 
Now, you might notice from this chart that the alcoholic content of beer isn't really that much more than what Jesus was drinking. His alcoholic content was 3% ABV. Most beer is 5% ABV. That is very true. But the million-dollar question is, how much volume of wine did Jesus consume? That matters hugely okay, to this discussion. Because if Jesus drank 17 glasses of wine with dinner, well, yeah, then that would you know, absolutely give us some permission to, to drink vodka. But I don't think Jesus drank 17 glasses of wine at all. And I will confess to you, though, we don't know exactly how much volume of alcohol Jesus consumed in a day or even at one meal. But here are some interesting points to consider when you're kind of asking this volume question. Number one, the Jews very concerned. And I honestly, you can really expand that out to a lot of the pagans as well. It wasn't just a Jewish thing. A lot of the pagans understood wine can be very dangerous. Okay, so very concerned about getting drunk. That's why they diluted it with water. Uh, and later we'll see some debates they were having about volume. But it wouldn't make much sense for them to dilute the water, excuse me, to dilute, dilute the wine with water and then drink a gallon of it. I mean, that, that kind of defeats the purpose if you're drinking massive amounts of, of volume of it. So whatever volume they were drinking, it, it would not have been a lot because of their very real concerns about drunkenness. Secondly, um, there's a scholar named Everett Ferguson. He wrote a famous paper called Wine as a Table Drink in the Ancient World. He doesn't give any specifics about volume, but he was talking about what they did for dinner and says about wine, quote, in Rome, a small amount was taken with the meal. Now, obviously, Romans also went to, you know, parties where they would drink purposely to excess and they would worship gods and drink wine in honor of the gods and get drunk all the time. But what Everett Ferguson was saying is that actually, when you're talking about just a table drink, just what they would have with dinner, it, it was a small amount. Now, again, the question is, well, what, what does small mean? Okay, uh, A modern day beer uh, averages like a 12 ounce 12 ounces, okay? Um, a, a modern day serving of wine is, is about five ounces. So, you, you know, you could say, well, I don't know if 12 ounces sounds like small or not, but, but you could also say that's kind of relative. Um, actually, our modern wine glasses hold about 14 ounces. Thirdly, in the Jewish Talmud, rabbis had arguments over how much wine was allowed at Jewish Passover feasts. At the feast, they would drink four cups of wine. So you could see how that would be a concern. <laughs> how much wine should we be putting in these cups if we're going to have four cups of wine with this Passover feast? Well, the more conservative rabbis said that the total of all wine between the four cups should be four ounces, which means the conservative rabbis were arguing for one ounce of wine per cup. That's not very much. But then the more you know, generous uh, or maybe liberal-minded with the, the wine would say, well, no, it would be 17 ounces spread out over four cups, which would be a little bit more than four ounces per cup. Well, you know, if you took an average between the conservative and the more generous um, renderings there, it would be about 10 and a half ounces of wine for the Passover meal. Now, you might say, hey, yeah, but that's, that's pretty close to one beer. And, you know, if they did the 17 ounce, well, that'd be even more than a 12 ounce beer. That's true. But, but also keep in mind, those four cups of wine would have been spread out over a period of a couple hours because they would have one cup and then they would have some prayers and they'd talk about God and some of the blessings. And then, they'd, you know, they'd have another cup and it would just it would be kind of a process. They're, they're not just taking all that wine in the four cups and just drinking it all at once. So keep that in mind as well. But here's where we have to have an honest uncomfortable moment. It's uncomfortable because I don't like alcohol. I don't drink it. I don't recommend that people drink it. And I have tried as hard as I could over the years, been preaching for 13 years. This issue comes up many, I've studied this probably four times. I always grab more books and try to study it deeper with, with each time because what I'm trying with all my might to do is to make the Bible say that 
we have to stay away from it completely. I, I, I want to adopt a position of complete and utter abstinence from alcohol. And I, over the years, have tried as hard as I could to make the Bible make that case. But I cannot do it. We have to be honest with the fact that we, we are not given any detail, really, in the Bible about volume and how much of it was consumed. And here's the most uncomfortable part. We also have to be honest with the fact that God never commanded his people to dilute their wine with water. God did not say wine is a blessing, but only if you dilute it with water to a point where there's just almost no alcoholic content. He does not say that. Dilution with water was a social convention developed over time because of very rightful concerns about drunkenness. God was very clear about drunkenness. Drunkenness is a sin. Don't get drunk. And so socially over time, people realize, okay, it's pretty easy to get drunk. <laughs> it's pretty easy to abuse alcohol. And so let's cut this stuff with, with water. So that was a, that was a social thing. But, but God never actually commanded people and said, you, thou shalt cut your wine with water. He, he didn't actually say that. Jesus would have diluted his wine with water down to 3% ABV because that's what everybody did in, in their day. But if that was not a command from God, that means that it is possible that God could have allowed people to drink wine up to 10 to 11 percent ABV, which would again have been kind of the strongest that they had. And you know, Deuteronomy 14 talks about them drinking strong drink, and priests were forbidden to drink strong drink, but only when they were serving and in particular doing their duties at the tabernacle, which assumes that they were having strong drink at other times outside of the tabernacle. So what this means is if a Christian today decides to drink a 12-ounce beer with 5% ABV or a 5-ounce glass of unfortified wine in the privacy of your home, it's true. Ancient people, they'd call you a, bar a barbarian. They'd think that was absolutely insane to be drinking alcohol that was unmixed with water. But God doesn't say that you're sinning against him for doing that. And no one can say that you are actually sinning for consuming alcohol in small, controlled amounts. I want to say that. I, I would absolutely love to say that. But I cannot bind where God does not bind. And it, it scares me not to. Because it scares me if I... If I if I give a little inch here and I say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say that it's sinful, well, then it sounds like, well, everybody's just going to go home and just get drunk today. <laughs> and, and, and I'm afraid of that. And so you, you want to rein people in, but you got to realize the, the New Testament is very balanced. Paul, Paul warns against a religion that is more restrictive than God. In Colossians chapter 2, he warns about people developing this aesthetic religion that says, don't touch this and don't taste this and you can't even go near, don't even think about getting any near anything pleasurable in life. And people in the first century, they're saying, you can't even have sex because if you're married. You can't even have sex when you're married because, hey, that's, that's too pleasurable and that's, that's evil and that's going to draw us away. We have to be very careful doing that, calling things evil that, that God says is a blessing, even if it's uncomfortable. God absolutely says that wine is a blessing, and it gladdens the heart. Now, that's partly because it tastes good. Wine was a real treat in the ancient world. They did not have, you know, that machine at, you know, these restaurants you go to, and it's just amazing. It's a touch screen, and there's like 200 drinks in there. You get just whatever soda you want. It'll, they didn't have that. They had water, and they had wine. I mean, that, that was kind of it, and wine... Compared to water, okay, it's, it's very sweet. It's very refreshing. It, it tastes much better. It, the sugar actually you know, gives you energy and does other things for you that gladdens your heart, which I'm going to mention in a second here. It also gladdened the heart because it reminded people of God's gracious provision for them, not just of their basic needs like water, but also of pleasurable things to enjoy in life like wine. And then, of course, it gladdened your heart because and for years I just... I, I tried to leave this third part of this off. It's like, this is awkward. I can't say this. Okay? But this is part of what wine does to gladden the heart. In the very early stages of drinking, it can lighten your mood and relax you. 
Now again, I want to be very clear that I am not recommending drinking. All I'm saying is that we can't say from Scripture that it is sinful in small controlled amounts. Really what I've been trying to do here is answer the question, can Christians drink alcohol? But there's a big difference between that question and the question, should Christians drink alcohol? God does say wine is a blessing, but he doesn't command people to drink wine. He doesn't say, thou must drink wine in order to please me. He doesn't say that. He leaves it up to us. But then he also gives us a whole lot of warnings about how dangerous it can be if not handled properly. And so before you decide to drink, here are some really important questions. Five important questions to ask yourself. Number one, will I know? If I cross the line into drunkenness, God very clear in the Old and New Testaments that drunkenness is absolutely a sin. It's why the ancients mixed wine with water, because they were so concerned about that. It's why the rabbis had debates over volume. How much exactly can we have? Because we were trying so hard to avoid drunkenness. And they did that. They had all those debates because God never said where the line is where a person crosses over into drunkenness. That actually depends on a lot of factors. It depends on your age. It depends on your body weight, your gender, your diet, your overall health, your genetics, how much you're drinking and how fast you're drinking it. Modern doctors, they say there is no designated, you know, safe level of of drinking because it all depends on the person. Now, typically, The law in the United States says it's illegal to drive with a blood alcohol content of 0.08%. And research is abundantly clear that long before that point, our reaction time can be slowed, our visual function and coordination can be impaired, we struggle to multitask, our behavior may be a little bit off, our judgment can be altered, being tipsy or buzzed can happen as early as 0.03% in some people, which is why in some states like Utah, they say you can't drive if your BAC is 0.05%. But again, the question is, what blood alcohol content is an acceptable level to God before he considers us drunk? He does not give us a BAC level. But the Bible does show us it's very easy to cross that line and go too far. Righteous people like Noah, Lot, the, many of the Israelites, the prophets just talked all the time about how the Israelites just totally given themselves over to drunkenness. They'd become heroes in drinking, is how Isaiah says it, very sarcastically. Studies also show that the more you drink, the more you're convinced in the moment that you are unaffected by it. And so it's hard to tell while you're drinking if you know, or excuse me, <laughs> It's hard to tell if you've gone too far in the moment while you're drinking. Uh, Here's an interesting verse. We haven't gotten to this. I hate to spoil this. I don't know if it's you or me, Dwayne, that has this chapter in Exodus. But in Exodus 19, 12, God tells Moses to establish a boundary around Mount Sinai, saying, take heed not to climb up the mountain or even touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain will be put to death. My question is, where does a mountain start? How can you tell the exact boundary of a mountain when it just kind of, you know, tapers into the ground (laughs) at the base? I think it'd be pretty hard to tell. And so the safest thing for the Israelites to do would just be to kind of, you know, stay as far away from that mountain as possible and not try to get up right next to the boundary of Mount Sinai and kind of testing where that line is. I think you just kind of stay away because it's, it's very difficult to tell whether I've crossed that boundary and now I'm touching the mountain and now I'm dead. So again, I I can't say it's sinful to have alcohol in small quantities. But before you drink our modern unmixed alcohol, ask yourself if you really think that you can do it without crossing an invisible line that you can't even see. Secondly, will I become addicted? We read this earlier in Proverbs 23 about not being seduced by wine. Because it's, it's dangerous. It, it stings like a viper, bites like a serpent. Some have suggested that this verse, and you know, I, I'm careful with this. I'm not 100% sure. I want to be careful not to read things from later centuries back earlier into the Old Testament. But some have suggested this verse is specifically warning about wine undiluted with water. 
which would be stronger. It would have that deeper red color to it, maybe. But the point is, God knows how alluring wine is to those who allow themselves to be seduced by it. To those enslaved to it, it becomes attractive and sparkly, and it's just silky smooth. And, and some are more susceptible to being sucked in to alcohol than other people. There's, there's research that shows that sometimes we have a, a genetic predisposition that makes us more susceptible to being drawn in and enslaved to alcohol. My question is, do you know if you're one of those people or not? I don't, personally, I don't really want to find that out. If I'm one of those people, I'd just rather kind of stay away from the mountain, personally. Now, the Bible makes it clear that if we are not cautious with alcohol, we can develop a disastrous habit. Earlier, the, the verses that lead up to this, he says, who has woe and who has sorrow and who has contentions and complaining and wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long over wine. Alcohol can be tremendously destructive. Every day, 385 Americans die from excessive alcohol use because abusing it is so detrimental to our physical health. My stepfather passed away a few years ago, and he was only in his 50s because alcohol abuse destroyed his liver. Many of you who were here years ago, you got to see up close and personal what it did to Robert Carter while he was staying with me trying to break free from his alcohol habit and eventually took his life too. It's responsible for 30% of traffic fatalities. There are 62,000 Alcoholics Anonymous groups just in the U.S. alone with 1.3 million active members trying desperately to break alcohol's hold in their life because it's destroying their relationships, their health, their finances, their brains, and most importantly, their relationship with God. It's estimated that 15 million Americans have some sort of alcohol abuse problem. For some of them, it's destroying other people's lives because they've killed someone while driving drunk or they hit their wife and they never thought they would ever do something like that or they cheated on their husband and they never thought they would ever do something like that but under the influence of alcohol, they're doing things that they never thought they would. They can't hold a job so their family suffers from extreme poverty. Paul says something interesting in 1 Corinthians 6, 12. He's responding to the Corinthians and says, all things are lawful for me but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me but I will not be mastered by anything. Paul acknowledges we do have some liberties in Christ, but he also knows not everything that we are free to do is helpful, and sometimes we can allow our freedoms to enslave us. So again, I can't say it's sinful to have alcohol in small quantities, and nor can I even define what small means <laughs> as much as I would like to. But before you drink, our modern unmixed alcohol, ask yourself if you think that you are self-controlled enough to drink it without it taking over your life and enslaving you like it has for billions of people over the centuries, even righteous people who never intended to be enslaved by it. Number three, will I cause someone else to sin? In Romans 14, Paul says this, Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil. For the man who eats and gives offense, it is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. There were some Christians in Rome who felt in their conscience that it was sinful to drink wine. Now, maybe that was because of some history they had with, with you know, alcohol abuse, uh, just concerns about getting drunk. It could also be many of the Gentiles especially came out of the cult of Dionysus. And Dionysus was the god of wine. And much of their former religious life was characterized by drunkenness because they would do this as a part of their worship. They would get drunk and work themselves up into a state of ecstasy because they felt like that was the way to connect with and be closer to the gods. And so now that they're Christians, they're saying, look, I'm, I'm staying far away from wine. And Paul's saying to respect other people's consciences and don't cause them to sin by pressuring them to drink or making fun of them for thinking that it's wrong for them to drink because that might actually violate their, their conscience and become sinful for them. In practical terms today, if, if you invite other Christians to your home and you put a bottle of wine out on the table, that could be very dangerous because you have no idea what this person's history is with alcohol. Maybe that's somebody who's had struggles in the past, but because you served it and you put it on your table, there's some social pressure there where they're going to feel like, oh, I, you know, I hate to tell them 
they can't drink it or, I, you know, I can't, I don't want to be rude, you know, I want to be a good host and accept the generosity. And you're, you're putting them in a, in a really awkward position. Even if you ask them ahead of time, hey, do you mind if I put one? Eh, sometimes it's hard to deal with that awkwardness and people don't want to <laughs> say, no, you can't have something in your own home. And, and so it's really something we need to be very careful about because they might end up drinking it just to sort of fit in and go along, even though they don't really feel comfortable with it. And Paul has this warning a few verses later, he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. Paul's saying if we're doing something and we have doubts about whether or not it's right and we do it anyway, that's sin. And so again, I, I can't say it's sinful to have alcohol in small controlled quantities, but before you drink in front of other Christians, ask yourself if you're confident this won't influence them to sin in any way. And ask yourself, do I have any doubts about whether drinking in front of other Christians is right or not? Because if I go ahead and do that, when I have doubts about it, then now I'm sinning against God because I'm violating my own conscience. Number four, will I set a good example for non-Christians? Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Peter refers to Christians as aliens and strangers because we don't belong to this present age of wickedness. We're supposed to live differently and keep our behavior excellent so nobody has any reason to slander us, and people have every reason to give glory to God because of the different life that we're living. And later in the letter, he says this, the time has already passed. Uh, the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. I understand Peter is not talking here about having one drink. But I'm bringing this verse in because it just seems sadly like drinking is woven in to our social fabric, to the point that almost anything can just kind of turn into a drinking party. Almost any occasion is used as a drinking party, like happy hour after work, football with the guys on Sunday, fun times in bowling league, wedding receptions, cruises, high school and college reunions and parties. It just seems like people are drinking all the time and looking for any excuse to have a drinking party. And yet non-Christians at the same time recognize eh, alcohol I don't usually make the best decisions when I'm drinking, and I've done some really dumb things. And so if we decide to drink in the presence of a non-Christian, you know, especially at something that has kind of turned into a drinking party, i got a couple questions about that. First of all, are we sure we're not doing that just to fit in and look cool and be accepted? If so, it's going to be really hard to convert them. If we're more interested in being like them. Secondly, are they going to know that we're only having a little? Are you going to be clear about that? Or are they just going to see a beer in your hand and assume you're just like everybody else? Another question is, if they see you drinking, is it going to embolden them to drink more? I mean, after all, if the Jesus guy or if the Jesus gal, if they're fine with it, I guess it's totally fine. I guess alcohol is great. It's true, Jesus did drink with sinners and tax collectors. But again, the wine was diluted, and drinking it as a table beverage was not perceived as irreligious in any way. Whereas some non-Christians today might view it that way. And some non-Christians, if they see you drinking, might be very surprised to see a Christian drink. They may even say, I thought you were a Christian. I didn't think you would drink. And maybe there's some room for explanation there to them. Some have argued that drinking in the presence of non-Christians, well, that might make us more relatable to have a small drink with them in some way. That could be possible, but it could also hurt our influence. And it's hard to know which way that's going to go. So again, I can't say it's sinful to have alcohol in small quantities, but before you drink in front of a non-Christian, ask yourself if you're confident this is going to help you influence them for Christ or if it may actually have a negative effect instead. And then finally this morning, will this help me serve the Lord? Some interesting verses in Peter's letter, in 1 Peter 1.3, he says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In verse 4 and 
excuse me, chapter 4, verse 7, the end of all things is near, therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Chapter 5, verse 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We're told as Christians to be sober and alert. And again, God never says, if you exceed X amount of blood alcohol content, well, then you're no longer sober and alert. He doesn't, he doesn't tell us that. But I'll just say, I think it's hard enough trying to live holy lives as Christians when we haven't had any alcohol. It's hard enough without alcohol to control our thoughts and to control our bodies and to discipline ourselves to read God's Word and to stay close to Him in prayer and to fight Satan's constant onslaught of temptation and to be constantly trying to grow spiritually. Personally, it's hard for me to believe that if I drink alcohol, even in small amounts, that that's going to help me be a stronger Christian in, in some way. Uh, just to give you an illustration, if, if you were about to board a plane and you saw your pilot with a glass of alcohol in his hands, that would probably be pretty concerning. And you would you know, maybe confront him about that, and he could say, well, hey, look, I'm not drunk. I mean, I'm just having a little bit. It just help me relax a little bit. It's fine. I mean, my BAC is only like .02 or whatever. It's still probably going to be a little rough uh, because you're thinking, I don't know if I want to trust my life to this guy. How alert is he really going to be? Because, again, depending on what he's drinking, right, how much of he drank, what his body weight is, all that stuff, all those factors kind of come into play. And you're like, ah, I don't know if I want to trust him flying a plane. Well, I don't know if I want to trust myself trying to fly my spiritual life, right? I know Jesus is my, my pilot, but still, I, I don't know that I want to be trying to live the Christian life under the influence of alcohol in any way. But again, I can't bind that on anybody. I, I, I can't say you're sinful if you have alcohol in, in small quantities, especially in the privacy of your home. But before you decide to drink, ask yourself, is this really going to help me grow spiritually to God's glory? Maybe some would say that it does in some way. And that's between them and God. I, I can't answer these five questions based strictly on ABV comparisons. Okay? I, I cannot condemn all alcohol consumption, but I hope we take God's warnings about it in Scripture very seriously. That we don't oversimplify the issue and say, well, Jesus drank, so I can. And that we'll be brutally honest with the answers to these five questions. Again, I can't answer them for you, but they are questions that cannot be ignored. And we will all answer to God for our own individual consciences on the day of judgment. And Paul wants us to take that very seriously in Romans 14. Well, if you're here and you're not a Christian, it's a little bit hard to transition into an invitation after that lesson. But I can point you to the, the beautiful picture in Isaiah of this wonderful banquet that God has prepared for us in heaven. And the point, nobody's going to be drunk in heaven. It's not, that's not going to happen in heaven. The point of the imagery is joy and rejoicing in God's provision and pleasure and enjoyment in His presence for all eternity. You can have that this morning. If you'll come to Jesus, repent of your sins, confess Him as your Lord, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you've already done that, and maybe you've been flirting with alcohol, and it's starting to get the better of you, and you're starting to become enslaved to it, and it's taking over your life, Jesus can set you free from that too. If you'll come to Him this morning and say, Lord, help me. Help me break free from this. And your brethren will help you with that here too. We're here to help in whatever way we can to prepare each other for that glorious eternal banquet with our Lord. Come forward and let us know how we can do that while we stand and sing.